Welcome back to this uh, second lecture of the course on nanostructured materials, synthesis, properties, self-assembly and applications. So, in the first lecture, we introduced you to the basic fundamentals of uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology. Uh, we gave you the definition of what are nanoparticles. Basically, uh, any particle with dimensions of between 1 to 100 nanometers is the region which normally is discussed as uh, the regime of nanomaterials. And then uh, we discussed what properties uh, change as a function of the size, especially optical properties, catalytic properties, magnetic properties, etc. And uh, then we traced a bit of history like uh, how the study of nanomaterials has developed over the years and how historically nanomaterials was known. And uh, uh, so, probably you have now uh, some idea of what are nanomaterials. So, in continuation with the first lecture, uh, today we are going to discuss some more aspects of nanotechnology, uh, mainly uh, what the future holds for nanotechnology. So, an introduction to that, uh, what are the applications in nanotechnology. And so, this second lecture will uh, be the uh, concluding part of the module 1 of this uh, course on uh, 40 lectures of nanostructured materials. So, uh, as uh, the senior advisor on nanotechnology of the National Science Foundation uh, in his lecture in uh, 2005, 2006 commented that uh, we would be needing around 10,000 students in nanoscience and technology per year. And uh, 50 percent of the products will be based on nanoscience and nanotechnology by the year 2015. And uh, many uh, devices are already being manufactured like passive nanostructures and active components and uh, uh, even small uh, components which are on X-ray diffractometers, uh, miniature X-ray diffractometers have already been made based on carbon nanotubes, uh, which are uh, on a space mission to Mars. And there will be several molecular machines by the year 2015. This has been uh, predicted by the senior advisor on nanotechnology of the National Science Foundation. Now, uh, we can see nanotechnology applications in future in everyday life. For example, uh, you can see uh, there will be thermochromic uh, glass uh, to regulate the amount of light which is going through a particular glass window. So, these can be coated with some nanomaterials which cut down uh, certain wavelengths of light. Similarly, you will be having organic light emitting diodes for displays. You will be having uh, photovoltaic films that convert light into electricity. Uh, then LEDs to have efficient uh, light bulbs at very low cost based on uh, uh, many new nanomaterials. And then you can have uh, glass coatings which are uh, scratch proof and uh, which have hydrophobic surfaces. They can be self cleaning. You can have uh, vibration less uh, surfaces like on vehicles. You can have uh, helmets made of uh, some nanomaterials, especially carbon nanofibers to make them very uh, compact and light and at the same time mechanically tough. Then you can have intelligent clothing which can at the same time for a sports person measure his pulse as well as his rate of respiration, etcetera. You can have frames of vehicles made of carbon fibers, which are very light. You can have fuel cells to provide uh, the uh, battery or the power to vehicles. And uh, that is a very important area of research for mobile phones, vehicles and uh, the spacecraft industry. You can have very efficient uh, uh, storing devices, magnetic storing devices. Uh, which can uh, made of 
uh, nanomaterials. So, in everyday life, it is predicted that nanotechnology will be there in future, and uh, we have all of us have to know a little bit about nanoscience and nanotechnology to be able to use them in our daily lives. Uh, continuing with applications, you will have applications of nanotechnology in uh, information sciences like uh, in the internet, in IT based systems to have smaller, faster, more energy efficient uh, computing systems. Then in energy to have low cost energy uh, production, design more efficient solar cells and design more efficient fuel cells. So, the nanostructured materials which go into a fuel cell the like the electrodes and the electrolyte, uh, how to engineer them uh, with nanomaterials that is going to be a challenge. Uh, batteries and biofuels all these will contribute to the uh, growing demand of energy in the future and as coal based and fossil fuel based uh, uh, fuel energy is going to be very difficult in the near future. So, we will have to depend on solar cells and uh, other uh, means of energy generation, uh, especially uh, renewable energy generation which can come from fuel cells and solar cells etcetera. Now, you can you will certainly have lot of implications in the health industry in medicines. Uh, using nanomaterials, uh, people are trying to do drug delivery and drug targeting. People are trying to make artificial ligaments and bones using nanomaterials uh, like calcium apatite etcetera. You, uh, various kinds of uh, new drugs, especially drugs with controlled release, so that uh, can be uh, are envisioned in the future. So, that you can take one medicine in the morning and it will release the drug in definite doses at different time intervals, so that you do not have to take the drug every uh, 6 hours or every 4 hours. Then, a lot of uh, interest or use of nanotechnology will be in uh, diagnostic tests where you can uh, use nanomaterials or nanostructures to do bioassays and biosensing and they can be done in a very quick time uh, on the patient's bedside at home so that you do not have uh, to delay treatment. A uh, lot of work using uh, uh, fluorescent uh, um, quantum dots can be used in imaging devices, which will be used in to diagnose tumor cells or cancer cells. And these are all part of the health industry, where nanotechnology is going to play a very important role. You are also going to see a lot of applications in uh, consumer goods, like in foods and beverages, especially in packaging industry. Uh, since uh, most of the biofilms or uh, other films which are made uh, can be the shelf life of food can be enhanced if the proper packaging materials can be made based on some bio nano materials. And uh, certain work has already been demonstrated in this direction. A uh, lot of work to uh, generate sensors which can uh, kind of analyze the quality of the food inside in packaged food are being uh, thought about. So, that as the food quality deteriorates, there may be a color change which you can observe from outside the packaged food, which will tell you uh, instead of looking at the uh, expiry date, you can look at the change in the color of the sensor and decide whether to use that food material or not. So, uh, food quality testing and food packaging uh, industry will uh, rely heavily on nanomaterials and nanotechnology. Uh, in smart appliances and smart textiles like stain proof textiles, waterproof textiles, there is lot of uh, work which has be, is already going on and there it 
has lot of prospects where nanotechnology will be used. Lot of self cleaning products and uh, scratch free products uh, in uh, windows and paints and uh, many uh, UV protection uh, cosmetics are already in the market which use TiO2 or other such nano materials which protect you from ultraviolet radiation. So, uh, there is lot of applications envisaged in the area of the uh, medical industry and the consumer goods industry. Some examples in details uh, we can discuss like uh, synthesis of nano powders of uh, several ceramics or metals like new catalysts or um, particles which are embedded within films to enhance the shelf life of food as we discussed in packaging industry and novel drug delivery devices where you have uh, some magnetic nanoparticles, uh, iron oxide is being used for these kind of uh, drug delivery systems where the magnetic particle can be tagged to a drug and also moved around with a magnetic field. Then carbon nanotubes uh, which are basically graphite uh, which is rolled into a cylinder, you can think about carbon nanotubes like that. These nanotubes are very strong but light and they are being used for a variety of uses because of its mechanical strength, because of its conductivity. So, carbon nanotubes hold wide uh, interest among uh, a range of applications starting from sensors to fuel cells to computers to um, heavy duty uh, fibers uh, which are of high strength and also as field emitters uh, which can emit electrons under a certain voltage. Then in nano membrane filtration systems uh, because uh, water purification remains to be a challenge for the world and more and more uh, we will need membranes, membrane based technologies to purify water and a uh, lot of work in this area is going on to generate nano materials which can remove toxins from water of different kind and generate these filtration systems. In nano electronics, uh, people are expecting that the silicon based uh, computer chips which is uh, reaching its uh, peak or uh, maximum uh, uh, that can be achieved using silicon chips is uh, nearly come to uh, its uh, peak. And so, we need to find out new devices and uh, some examples of nano devices based on what are called cross bar latches are being developed by Hewlett Packard in the United States. So, uh, as you see the quantum dots could be used for several applications in biosensing, quantum electronics, photonics and clean and efficient energy generation. So, if we look around us, uh, we will see man made objects like consumer products based on nanomaterials and nanotechnology. For example, you have these sunblock creams, which are basically nanoparticles, some of them of TiO2 and, uh, and other nanomaterials, which are already in the market, which are being used uh, as creams or lotions, and they are based on nano particles. Similarly, you have nanostructures uh, formed of uh, carbon nanotubes or other nanotubes or uh, uh, porous nanostructures arranged in a particular fashion which interact with light to give you uh, displays which you can use for several applications. And this is a subject of what is called nanophotonics. And in nature also you can see from the nano uh, structures like uh, fibrous uh, structures in the spatulae to uh, hairs and then to lamellae and finally to uh, feet. Uh, you can see from the starting uh, particle to the end product. Similarly, in man made objects you can see the uh, nano materials with which you start and the finished product there is a lot of change as you go along this chain. And this if you look at the from the economics point of view, you start with these nanostructures, they have 
uh, may be some cost, but as you turn towards the finished product, there is a lot of engineering which goes, manipulation which goes and the cost of the final product of course, becomes uh, much higher. So, uh, these are some of the consumer products which are already there in the market. You can have other products like uh, purification of water, or clean water, where you design membranes which can remove metal ions from toxic water or can remove uh, biomolecules and then can give you clean water. So, this is a very important area for uh, the future to provide clean and safe water using membranes made of nanostructures. Then uh, coming to some uh, real products which are in the market developed based on nanomaterials. Uh, there is this uh, product called biosilicon. It is a biomaterial, it is a form of silicon which has been uh, made to have very porous structures. It has a honeycomb like structure and is being used for drug delivery coatings and uh, it, it is biodegradable. So, uh, biosilicon is a product which is already in the market and can also be used in biocompatible diagnostic products. This is another product which has been made by another company called the Ambry ICSTM and here uh, what it has is it, it there are these cartridges which have these electrodes uh, arrays uh, on these uh, strips and these arrays act as uh, biosensors and so if you add a drop of blood or urine, it can identify certain markers which will tell you about uh, an impending disease like if there is an increase in the blood sugar level or an increase in some uh, particular protein which is normally uh, enhanced before a cardiac arrest. So, these kind of biomarkers can be checked if you have the right biomolecules on this chip. So, it is basically a molecule on this electrode which will be sensed when you put this cartridge inside this handheld gadget and then what happens you can diagnose the uh, level of that particular marker. Of course, you have to use a particular biomolecule to target or to uh, uh, sense a particular protein or amino acid or nucleic acid in the uh, human uh, in the human body or any living body. So, these kind of products which are uh, single use disposable cartridges for uh, diagnostics are already coming up in the market. This is another uh, uh, company which makes nano powders. Uh, they make lot of nano powders for like TiO2, zinc oxide or cerium oxide for uh, several products uh, for healthcare, for catalysts and for environmental applications. And uh, one application is shown here which is the UV blocker. So, the UV radiation is blocked uh, whereas, the visible light uh, these particles are transparent and it will allow visible light to pass through with very less scattering of the light. So, these kind of nanomaterials are already in the being uh, commercially sold in the market. There is another application for which a company has come out with a product. This is a supercapacitor. A uh, supercapacitor is something which is a can store very large amount of energy. Uh, compared to a normal battery, a supercapacitor can uh, store much more energy. And so, these are important uh, materials uh, and uh, these are important products and they use uh, carbon based nanomaterials, nanostructured materials. This is one of the products which has been developed. Of course, other supercapacitor based on other mat oxide materials are also being made and uh, this is already in the market. So, this is another example of a product based on nanotechnology which is in the market. This is another example of how uh, nanotechnology can be of great use in uh, fuel and energy uh, considerations. Uh, for example, this is a membrane, nanoporous membrane which has been developed 
which can separate carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So, you have these uh, nanoporous membranes and uh, because of the particular size of, of the pores, it can separate hydrogen from carbon dioxide. So, normally when you have a hydrocarbon or petroleum based industries, they produce these hydrocarbons and from these hydrocarbons you get carbon dioxide and hydrogen which can be used in uh, application, but you have to separate the carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So, these kind of membranes are very important and then if you can separate hydrogen from carbon dioxide, then this hydrogen can be used as a fuel and can produce energy. And so, this kind of application based on nano membranes has is of tremendous interest. This is another uh, idea of building a very energy efficient house. So, this has a coating on the roof of the house. Normally, the roofs uh, get heated and uh, for the heating of the house, the roofs are the most important structures and so you need a lot of air conditioning for cooling. Now, if you have a efficient radiative paint on top of the roof, then instead of heating, it becomes a cooling element and uh, many nanostructured paints are being used or tiles are being used which can bring down the uh, which have a radiative cooling effect rather than a heating effect and uh, that is one important application. Of course, this kind of a model house which is called a nano house has other uh, aspects like uh, windows which uh, are uh, which allow certain wavelengths of light to pass, uh, sensors which uh, save uh, which allow a, diff a different uh, time, different amount of light to enter and uh, self lighting systems depending on what is the in light intensity outside and inside, the sensors allow the lighting to turn on or turn off and uh, many, many applications of solar cells like solar heating of the water and solar electricity uh, based on uh, efficient solar cells uh, together, then this model house uh, is the real futuristic house based on nanotechnology. Now, uh, the finally I come to what we are going to discuss in our next uh, four or five lectures that is uh, how the nanomaterials are to be synthesized. So far we discussed about the uh, we got, got you introduced to the subject of nanotechnology and why somebody should be interested in nanotechnology, the applications of nanotechnology and what the future holds for nanotechnology. But the most important thing is how will you make these nanomaterials and these nanostructures. So, uh, two approaches are uh, considered when trying to synthesize something at the nano scale. One is the top down approach and the other is the bottom up approach. So, uh, in the top down approach, uh, it is like uh, you make a statue out of so stone, you take a big rock like from the mountain and you start chiseling the rock that means cutting down the rock to a particular shape which you have in front of you as a drawing and you want to make carve out the statue out of the stone. So, that means you are removing the stone from the sides and making a particular shape within that rock. Now, this process involves a lot of wastage because you are throwing away a lot of material which is in the stone. Okay? And so, hence this kind of uh, methodology uh, will be seldom used in making uh, large scale uh, nanostructures in nanotechnology. So, breaking down matter into basic building blocks that is the top down approach and uh, normally we try to avoid this when you have to use nanomaterials in very large scale applications. Okay. Uh, however, top down fabrication is often easily achieved rather than the bottom up approach, uh, but the cost and uh, is uh, kind of forbids us to use this in large scale applications, especially if the end product is not going to produce a lot of revenue. Now, the methodologies which people have used for the top down uh, processes 
people have used different kinds of lithography processes. The term lithography of course, comes from lithos which is stone. So, you are doing uh, a kind of a structure or drawing from stone and that is why it is called lithography. And in top down uh, processes, you can have different kinds of lithography. You can have photolithography that means, you are a kind of removing atoms from the surface using light or you can have electron beam lithography where you are using atoms and materials using electron beams. And then after you remove certain uh, atoms, you create a structure which can be called a stamp and then you make an imprint of this stamp called a nano imprint on another material which may be more flexible like a polymer. So, here you can see you have a polymer called PMMA on a substrate silicon and you have a stamp and you make an imprint. And so, you can use masks or you can do maskless printing. So, there are many, many techniques in uh, the lithographic methodology uh, which one can do in this top down approach. So, you can see these are many structures uh, which have been made by removing parts which are around them and uh, removal of these parts around them uh, you have used basically by what we call either photolithography or electron beam lithography and you have used a mask. The mask was kept here it can be called it can be kept here and so you remove only the places where the mask is not there and it can be another way also the other way. So, it is called sometimes it is called positive etching or negative etching etcetera. But uh, this is uh, the basis of top down approach where you have a large object and you create small objects by removing parts of the body from that large object. Now, in the bottom up approach it is like building a house from bricks. So, you take a one brick and put another brick on top of it in a particular arrangement and then you finally, get a house. So, in the bottom up approach you start with atoms and molecules and then you build clusters or a range of clusters. They can be 20 atoms big or 200 atoms big or 2000 atoms big and, but here you have to build from atom or molecules and then put them together. Uh, and here you will have very less wastage and you will have to uh, study how covalent bonds will be formed between these atoms or molecules. And the problem here is to build very large structures because you are starting from atoms and molecules. So, how big the structures you can make in a controlled manner using this bottom up approach uh, that is the big challenge. Uh, in uh, nature always uses bottom up approach, it always uses building molecules uh, even the human beings starting from a single cell. So, it is possible to build very complex system from atoms and molecules. However, uh, the technology that man has uh, is yet very primitive compared to what nature has. And so, it will take a long time before we can assemble a machine made, made of molecules which nature makes every day million times all around us. So, uh, with that we come to the end of the lecture 2 and the end of the module 1 of this introduction to nanotechnology. And uh, in the next lectures, we will uh, take up the each of these uh, bottom up approaches the low temperature synthetic roots uh, which are of different kinds and we will take them uh, one at a time and study all the different types of methodologies used in the synthesis of nanomaterials using the chemical approach or the bottom up approach in building nanostructures. That will be the next part of this course. And till then, goodbye and see you later. Thank you very much.